Welcome to the Tarleton Library's session on videos, educational exemption versus performance rights. Over the past few months, our task force has received numerous questions regarding films in the classroom, online, and beyond. So we hope that today's session provides answers to your questions and that you find it beneficial moving forward. This session is being brought to you by the members of the Tarleton Library's Copyright Task Force. We are not lawyers, so we won't typically give yes or no answers. We are more likely to answer with, it depends, because much of copyright lives in the gray area with many factors up for interpretation. The material in this video is intended for information purposes and should not be interpreted as legal advice. Our role is to be a source of information and best practices regarding copyright issues. We want to assist the campus in being copyright compliant as well as help determine what rights you do have as educators. Now I want to introduce you to members of the Copyright Task Force. I'm Jennifer Sherwood, Assistant Director for User Services and Chair of the Copyright Task Force. Hello, I'm Kimberly Scow, the Coordinator for Access Services. Hi, my name is Christy Tabers and I'm the Coordinator for Reference Services. Hello, I'm Jody Tennyson, Acquisition Librarian. Hi, I'm Joshua Wallace and I'm an instruction librarian. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Kim Scow, who will get us started with fair use. Educators are most familiar with fair use for using copyrighted works in their class assignments. Fair use does not have a yes or no answer. It's a spectrum that is more or less likely to be considered fair. There are four factors to consider when trying to determine if you are following fair use guidelines. First is the purpose and character of your use. If you're using the material for educational purposes, it is more likely to qualify as fair use. If you're using the material for commercial purposes or will make a profit, you have a much weaker argument for fair use. Second is the nature of the copyrighted work. There is generally more leeway if you're pulling factual information from works as opposed to copying information from a fictional work. Third is the amount and substantiality of the portion taken. The less you take, the more likely it is to fall under fair use in general, but it is not a promise. You cannot take the heart of the work. Even if the entire document is 200 pages and you only use 10, if the court determines that content was the most important factor, you could lose your argument of fair use. The rule of thumb is generally 10%. So, for example, providing the first chapter of a book on reserve in the library to get you by while you wait for the bookstore to receive your book would likely be okay. Then, when the books arrive, you could pull the copy from the library to best comply with fair use. Fourth is the effect of the use upon the potential market. Is your work depriving the copyright owner income? Does the new work act as a substitute for the original? This would take away potential profit from the original copyright holder and is less likely to qualify as fair use. Video use in the classroom has an exception that goes beyond fair use though, providing you more protections. Section 110 of Title 17 of the United States Code grants a specific exemption from copyright law for performance or display of a work by instructors or pupils in the course of face-to-face -face teaching activities of a nonprofit educational institution in a classroom or similar place devoted to instruction. So let's break Section 110 down. There are several criteria you must meet in order to qualify for the classroom exemption. First, this applies to face-to-face -face instruction, not distance education. Josh will speak more on online options later in this presentation. Second, the exception applies to showing films in physical classrooms or similar places devoted to instruction. So, for example, if the class walked over to a different room that was more suitable for viewing the movie, this would be permitted. Third, the institution must be nonprofit. 
Fourth, the video being watched must tie directly to the curriculum. Showing films is not intended as a way to let your class have a day off or to fill time. Instructional activities need to be taking place. Fifth, the teaching activity needs to be kept to the classroom. Therefore, the showing cannot be open to the public. We once received a question about the ability to show videos to a student organization in a campus residence hall. They felt that adding discussion questions would add an educational component, so therefore showing the film would be allowed. But that does not meet the above criteria. This is not for a class with an assigned curriculum. In addition, it would be very difficult to ensure that the public was not able to gain access in a residence hall location. Students live in the building and bring their friends through common areas. In this case, we felt showing the film needed public performance rights. If you meet the criteria discussed on the last slide, then you as the instructor can play a movie or film in your class. You are not restricted to a specific length of time. You can show the entire work if desired. Similarly, students can utilize video or music within an assignment. It is important to note that the instructor must be present in the class. We have received questions before about this, where teachers want to know if they can let a student worker start the movie while they're out at a conference. This does not qualify as instruction. The teacher must be present. Also, remember that videos shown must be obtained legally. You have several options for accessing legally obtained videos. They can be videos you purchased yourself, videos you checked out from a library or rental store, you can borrow a copy from someone else as long as it was also legally obtained. You can show YouTube videos as long as they were uploaded by the copyright holder. Many people post copyrighted content online without permission, so be sure to check who is posting the video. Many people ask about the ability to show videos from a subscription service that they pay for. For example, Netflix, Hulu, iTunes, or Amazon. When streaming a video from a service you personally subscribe to, you must check the licensing terms. When you sign up for the service, you sign a user agreement to access their content. Licensing will always take precedence over copyright and fair use. If the terms limit you to personal use or household use, you're better off finding a physical copy of the item. So remember, Title 17, Section 110 permits the display of a copyrighted work in face-to-face -face activities. This does not extend to online courses. There are options, though, for online courses, which Josh will cover next. I'm Joshua Wallace, and I will be discussing videos in online classes. Before I get started on the topic, I want to make clear that copyright law is gray and flexible. There's often not a clear answer about whether or not a particular usage of copyrighted material is a violation of copyright law. You will be on safer ground if you follow best practices, think through the four fair use factors, and document how your use complies with those factors. The TEACH Act governs the usage of video and other copyrighted media for distance education courses. Although online classes do not qualify for the classroom exemption, fair use still applies. The TEACH Act emphasizes reasonable and limited portions of films. Therefore, showing an entire film will rarely be considered reasonable and limited. However, remember that I said that the law is gray. Showing an entire film might be considered fair use depending on the situation. Keep in mind that an instructor will have an even greater burden to justify how it was educationally necessary to show an entire film if the usage is challenged in court. Therefore, it is much more risky to show an entire film. An example of a potential justification would be for a film studies class. Also, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act prohibits the hacking of technology meant to prevent the copying of DVDs and other media. Such an action would not be protected by fair use. According to the Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for Academic and Research Libraries, written by the Association of Research Libraries in 2012, courts have recently focused in on two key questions in copyright cases. Number one, did the use transform the material taken from the copyrighted work by using it for a broadly beneficial purpose different from that of the original, or did it just repeat the work for the same intent and value as the original? An example. 
A film created for entertainment purposes is being shown for an educational purpose. Question number two, was the material taken appropriate in kind and amount considering the nature of the copyrighted work and of the use? Use only the amount needed for the educational purpose. If that is the entire film, then be able to articulate your rationale. These questions basically condense the four fair use factors. If the answer is yes to both questions, then a court is more likely to determine that the use was fair. Over the next few slides, I'm going to discuss some best practices. Following these makes it more likely that your use will be considered fair. Number one, if possible, link to videos rather than uploading a copy of them. Links are not protected by copyright. Number two, if copying a video, only use the amount needed to serve your educational purpose. Number three, only make the video available to students for a period of time that is relevant to the context of a class session. This is true for all media in an online class, video, audio, images, etc. You shouldn't keep videos up for the entire semester. Rather, only for a limited time that makes sense for the lesson that the video supports. For example, if you cover a new lesson each week, then only keep the video up for that week. Number four, avoid copying videos from materials created and marketed primarily for use in courses. For example, a DVD with video content comes with the course textbook. Rather than having the students buy the textbook DVD combo, you upload that video content onto your online course. This usage is unlikely to be transformative and would negatively impact the market of the copyright owner. Therefore, it's unlikely to be considered fair use. Number five, make sure that the video serves an educational purpose. Don't use it for entertainment. Number six, place the video in the context of the course. Explain why it was chosen and what it is intended to illustrate. Consider using background readings study questions, commentary, criticism, annotation, and student reactions when showing videos. The more you can do this, the stronger your fair use case would be. Number seven, limit access to students enrolled in the course. Distance learning management systems like Blackboard make it easy to comply with this provision. Do not upload such content to a personal website or social media account. Number eight, when possible, use streaming or other technologies that limit students' ability to download, copy, or redistribute material. Number nine, notify students that videos are being made available for teaching, study, and research only. Number 10, provide attributions to known copyright owners of the videos. Kim and I have discussed showing videos in the educational context. What if you want to show a video outside of a classroom environment, such as in a student club meeting or a dorm common area? Then you'll probably need public performance rights to do so. I will now turn things over to Jody, who will tell us more about what public performance rights are. I'm Jody Tennyson, and I will be talking about performance rights and when you need to obtain permission to show videos or films. So what are performance rights? They are the legal rights to show a film or video in public. These rights are managed by the distributor or publisher, and by obtaining a public performance license, it allows others to use them. Copyrighted films are not automatically licensed for public performance. Generally, films in the library's DVD collection do not have public performance rights, and none of the featured films have those rights. Showing a film or video to groups outside the classroom, whether borrowed from a library, rented, purchased, or streamed, may be illegal and could place the university at risk for possible lawsuits. You must obtain performance rights if the viewing is open to the public, if the viewing is in a public space, and when a club or organization is in attendance. Individuals and organizations are responsible for obtaining performance rights for publicly screened media, even if the event is free. 
So when do you need to get permission? When you acquire a DVD or videotape of a movie, you obtain the physical copy, but not the copyrights to that movie. By law, your rights are very limited when you show it to the public. Therefore, you must determine if the showing constitutes a public performance. So let's talk about streaming videos. Here are a few of the streaming media databases that our library subscribes to, which includes public performance rights. Canopy contains thousands of streaming films, documentaries, and training videos in a variety of subject areas from a large range of producers. Films on Demand contains video clips and full-length videos that cover a large number of subject areas. Overdrive contains full-length videos. As discussed earlier, the producer manages public performance rights. How they manage those rights do vary, so let's look at all three platforms and see how they differ. Canopy provides streaming videos with public performance rights, and the producer allows any authorized viewer to watch their videos, whether it be in a group or individual. However, there can be no admission charged or profit made. So who is an authorized user? Under our license agreement with Canopy, authorized users are defined as currently enrolled students, faculty, and staff. The general public is not considered authorized users under our license. Films on Demand. This platform offers streaming videos that include public performance rights. In their collection, programs are offered from the History Channel, the Biography Channel, BBC, and other news channels. Overdrive. Publishers decide the digital rights for all title formats. By allowing permission to these titles, they outline what you can and cannot do with the borrowed title. Overdrive allows viewing films in a group forum and is permitted as long as the viewing is by authorized viewers and it is not for commercial benefit. Videos have extra permissions and these rights determine how you can watch the video when you borrow it. In Overdrive, you can view a video's permission from its detailed page by opening the tab. I pulled up the video, Steve Jobs, The Man in the Machine. Once I clicked on the Details tab, it showed me that this streaming video does not allow public performance rights. Now I'll turn it over to Jennifer, who will talk more about performance rights. Okay, so Kim and Josh discuss the face-to-face -face classroom and online exemptions. And with these exemptions in the two types of classroom settings, that may be all you need. Jody discussed some of our library resources with public performance rights built into our license agreements, but obviously we can't cover all films. So what do you do if your need doesn't fall under the educational exemptions or is not in our library film collection. For example, the Student Government Association wants to sponsor a movie night or the Horticultural Club wants to show Little Shop of Horrors during their membership drive. In these cases, you may need to explore your options for obtaining public performance rights. There are some options for obtaining public performance rights. You can check to see if your selected work is in the public domain, find out if your copy of the film already has public performance rights, seek permission directly from the copyright holder, or pay for the rights through a licensing vendor. It can be hard to tell if an item is in the public domain. The provisions of copyright law dealing with duration are complex. Even those that sell public domain videos find it challenging. But there are a few things we can do to determine a work's copyright status. Number one, the copyright has expired. Any work published in the United States before 1923 
is in the public domain. Number two, works published before 1964 and the copyright was not renewed are in the public domain. Renewal was a requirement for works published before 1978. Number three, works published before March 1st, 1989 without an appropriate copyright notice are in the public domain. Right now, under the Berne Convention, you are not required to display a copyright notice. However, works published before March 1, 1989 did require the display of an appropriate copyright notice. Number four, works donated to the public domain by the copyright holder. Some creators are not looking to profit from their work and intentionally publish their work into the public domain. Number five, government produced works are generally not eligible for copyright protection. Anyone can use a public domain work without obtaining permission or public performance rights, but no one can ever own it. These works are made freely available to everyone with no strings attached. Once a work goes into the public domain, you no longer have any power over how the work is used since it is then owned by the public as a whole. There are companies that specialize in selling films in the public domain. So what you are paying for are their costs to provide you the physical copy. These companies typically print on demand. The films are in the public domain, so there are no restrictions on their use. Festival Films has American films made before 1964. Each film purchased comes with a specific statement as to why it is in the public domain. Buyout footage has historical public domain stock footage. They provide a written copyright search report for all public domain titles sold. OpenFlix provides a directory of movies commonly thought to be in the public domain. Desert Island Classics claims to be the oldest and largest public domain movie and TV library in the world. Here you can see that they are selling this DVD called Kung Fu Mama for $12.99. And in the specifications, you can see that copyright is blank. This title, according to Desert Island Classics, has no copyright and is in the public domain. Other sources for public domain footage include the National Archives and Records Administration. They have an extensive collection of films created for and produced by the U.S. government, which include military, educational, and documentary films from 1915 through 1976. Internet Moving Image Archive provides near unrestricted access to digitized collections of moving images, including advertising, educational, industrial, and amateur films from 1927 through the present. Broadcast quality copies can be purchased through Getty Images. Most of the physical copies of videos owned by the library do not have public performance rights. And the Copyright and Teach Act exemptions work well for us. However, if you and your department want a title purchased with public performance rights, Jody Tennyson, our acquisitions librarian, will do her best to work with you to purchase what you need with your departmental funds. 
Most vendors sell their videos under two different types of licenses. The home use only version is typically what you get if you rent a video from Redbox or Netflix. And we've all seen the FBI warning and disclaimers. You may see this motion picture is protected pursuant to the provisions of the laws of the United States of America and other countries. Any unauthorized duplication, distribution, and or exhibition of this motion picture may result in civil liability and criminal prosecution. Then there are those sold as institutional versions. They are much more expensive but include public performance rights. There are vendors that sell blanket or umbrella licenses. Films on demand comes to mind. Their videos come with public performance rights for the campus and community. You might see a library license where use is restricted within a library system or for valid members. I think of our Canopy license here because we can only show their videos to current students, faculty, and staff. Another option is to contact the copyright holder directly or contact the distributor. Only the copyright holder has the authority to grant licenses, sell public performance rights, or give permission for a particular public performance use. You can always purchase videos with rights. There are several vendors that sell videos that include public performance rights. You can contact the licensing service representing the particular studio or title. Criterion Pictures USA offers non-theatrical performance rights. They represent studios like 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, TriStar Pictures, and Columbia Pictures. Swank Motion Pictures, or Movie Licensing USA, a division of Swank, are a major movie distributor and a public performance licensing agent in non-theatrical markets where feature entertainment movies are shown. They represent Walt Disney Studios, Touchstone Pictures, Paramount Pictures, Columbia Pictures, Universal Studios, and DreamWorks Pictures. Other licensing agencies include Kino International, Modern Sound Pictures, Motion Picture Licensing Corporation, and New Yorker Films. Obtaining a public performance license for a film is relatively easy. Fees are determined by the number of times the film will be shown, how large the audience will be. Fees generally range between $200 to $600 per showing. My colleagues have touched on this a little bit throughout the presentation, but the good news is that there are some great alternative resources available to take the guesswork out of using videos. Specifically, the library pays for streaming media resources that you can utilize in the classroom, but you will need to check each licensing agreement to make sure you're using the resource appropriately. For example, media available through Films on Demand include performance rights and can be shown in the class, the library, or remotely to members of the campus community. Also, Canopy states that their videos can be watched by authorized users, which you are an authorized user if you have an NTNet login. These videos can be viewed in a group or individual context. If viewing in a group, it would need to be in a non-commercial setting. You can access the library streaming media sources from the library's homepage. Use the right-hand navigational bar to select the Collections tab, then click on Streaming Media. From there, you will be taken to a list of library resources. 
Additionally, there are free web resources that allow for non-commercial use. For example, TED Talks allow their videos to be shown in a non-commercial setting, as long as you access their content from their website or from the official TED Talk YouTube channel. Another example is YouTube. YouTube allows users who upload original content to mark their videos with a Creative Commons license for reuse. So you can search through content for videos with Creative Commons licensing. You will need to perform your search first, then click on the filter link under the search bar. Then you will need to select Creative Commons under the Features option. So you may be wondering what Creative Commons licensing actually is. Basically, it is a standard way for content creators to grant someone permission to use their work. It's important to note that there are different types of Creative Commons licensing, so it's imperative that you check the license. That concludes our presentation. Please email any copyright questions directly to mylibrary at tarleton.edu. Thank you for listening.